Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome um, to LitFest Pasadena and welcome to Stories of the New Unionism. Um, our host, Mia, is having some technical difficulties, so we're going to have a kind of casual conversation here uh, about uh, storytelling, union organizing, and uh, kind of the creative, the creative work and creativity of the labor movement today. Um, so I'm joined, um, well, first I'll introduce myself. My name is Lindsay Zafir. Um, I uh, am the editor of The Forge, which is an online journal by and for organizers about organizing strategy and practice. I'm also a PhD candidate in the history department at Yale University. And while I was at Yale, I was a leader in the grad worker um, union drive. Um, I was a lead organizer on our campaign through our 2017 NLRB elections and our uh, contract fight. Um, I'm really happy to be joined by Todd Wolfson. Todd is an associate professor in the Department of Journalism and Media Studies at Rutgers University. He is also the president of Rutgers AAUP AFT, uh, which represents 8,000 people at the university. Um, and he's a co-director of the Media Inequality and Chance Center. Uh, I, we're also here with Carolina Miranda. She's an arts and urban design columnist for the Los Angeles Time, Times, where she covers art and culture. Uh, and she is a founding co-chair of the Los Angeles Times Guild Employee Union. Uh, Christine O'Connell is, oh, Christine, I don't know if I have your bio, <laughs> but I, let me see, I'll pull it up on the Forge site. Christine is the president of the Union of Rutgers Administrators, AFT, Local 1766, um, and she's been the president since January 2019. Um, she previously worked as the lead organizer for URA, URA AFT for three years. Um, thanks, Christine. Uh, and Arlene Inouye is the UTLA United Teachers Los Angeles Secretary and Chair of the UTLA nego Negotiations Team. Uh, she's been a social justice community activist, multicultural human relations specialist, and was the former founder and director of a coalition to stop the militarization of youth. And finally, we have Raphael Jamie. Uh, Raphael is a PhD candidate in English at UCLA. Um, his research focuses on pre-modern history of risk. He is a, also a labor organizer with UAW 2865, the union representing the 19,000 teaching assistants, tutors, and readers at the University of California, and he was elected president of UAW 2865 this past April. And I just got word that Mia is joining us, so I think we'll wait for Mia to, to kick off our conversation. Hi, Mia. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. All right, I think we got this yes. to work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, thanks to our panelists for being here today. Thanks to everybody watching uh, wherever in the world you are. I want to especially thank Andrew Tonkovich, um, who's a lecturer at UC Irvine and a leader with University Council American Federation of Teachers um, for putting this panel together. My name is Mia McIver. I teach as a lecturer in the writing programs at UCLA, and I'm president of UCAFT, the union representing 7,000 contingent faculty and librarians at all UC campuses. Um, we have a lot of stories of the new unionism for you today. I'm going to say just a couple brief words of introduction for our panelists. Um, panelists, if you'd like to share more about yourself um, uh, in addition to what I'm introducing, please go ahead. Carolina Miranda is arts and urban design columnist for the LA Times, where she covers mm -hmm. art and culture. She's been a reporter Mia, for Time Mia, Magazine. Her, her. Mia, Mia. Yes. I did introduce you before you came in. Came in. Great. Wonderful. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll jump in. Um, all right. So I've asked panelists um, to think about a couple of different questions. Um, one is a brief story that uh, about something that animates your organizing. Um, this could be um, a historical episode that's a touchstone for you, um, uh, an anecdote about building power, um, a narrative that you use in, uh, in member outreach conversations. Um, so let's go to uh, Carolina first, um, and then we'll hear from Raphael, um, Christine, Arlene, and Todd. Thanks so much, Mia. And thank you to Lindsay for bravely jumping in to 
be willing to moderate this at the last minute uh, with a virtually no preparation. You are a stronger person than I. Um, <laughs> and, and anyway, uh, thank you so much for having me here today. And thanks to everyone at LipFest for this great event. Hopefully next year we'll all be together in the same room. I think, you know, one of the things for me and one of the things, there, there were multiple things that made us interested in organizing at the LA Times. And I think two narratives that Ray, that come to the surface for us is one, um, protecting journalism at a time in which journalism is in a very tenuous uh, position in our society, both from the, you know, the shutdowns of many media organizations uh, over the last decade combined with literal attacks uh, on journalists and the whole notion of fake news. I think uh, unionization for us represented um, an opportunity to collectively counter that narrative, to stand up against those narratives and to also you know, stand up to ownership who might not always be doing things that are in our best interest. And I think, but I think one of the other big motivating factors and I think what made the campaign at the LA Times so dynamic on top of the fact that the LA Times had this like long history of being an anti-union newspaper. So of course the irony of this very loud and noisy union emerging uh, from its newsroom was kind of this great thing was, you know, us really trying to think long and hard about the history of race and unions, which uh, can be quite troubled, you know, in terms of the history of exclusionary practices in some unions historically and how we, um, you know, we wanted to be a new type of union, ones in which uh, debates over working conditions and wages were as important as questions of diversity and representation, and that those are issues that intersect um, perfectly with the question of journalism and who writes stories, who frames them, who is the audience, what kinds of stories are we telling in a, in a very diverse city like Los Angeles. And I think for me, the, one of the one of the principal animating factors of that campaign was, I think, how seriously so much of the staff took that issue. Because you know, diversity is something that, as we know, a lot of people have talked about, but action has always been very limited. And to see a group of employees come together as a united front and taking that as one of its major issues um, was really was really important to us. You know, one of the first things we did was a pay equity study to look at how the staff was getting paid in in relationship to each other. So I think, yeah, two two stories: protecting journalism, but also thinking about who gets to be a journalist and who is supported in that endeavor within the newsroom. Great start, Raphael. Hi, uh, thank you, um, and thank you, Mia and uh, Lindsay, also for uh, trying for moderating. Um, yeah, I think what I, what motivates me as labor organizer is uh, you know thinking about what is actually the role of a public university. I think uh, for too long uh, we've seen uh, just a trend of a disinvestment in public education that has turned I think the University of California to an elite institution in a, in a different sense, uh, so in a university that's really inaccessible to uh, the Cal to Californians, uh, most working class Californians. And you know you can see that especially in grad school uh, in seminars where uh, there isn't a lot of diversity. Um, you know, I, I'm a medieval, I work on medieval literature. Uh, medieval studies has for a long time been known for being extremely white and male dominated. And, you know, I just got off and I just came back from um, uh, the Kalamazoo uh, conference, which is the biggest conference for medieval studies. And yeah, this is some issue that, we, uh, that we've been struggling with for a long time in our field. And unfortunately, it's, uh, I think we've seen it over the through the Trump years, how uh, medieval studies itself was used for uh, justifying a lot of the, uh, uh, yeah, you saw how it was weaponized by uh, a protest in Virginia. But anyway, um, I guess, yeah, the question is like, what kind of university do we want to have? What uh, What is a truly public university? And I think uh, unions, uh, labor unions have an incredible role to play in making a, a, a public education truly public, a uh, place where, um, where people from walks of life can come and succeed. Um, and I think, you know, that's because uh, 2065 together with uh, UCAFT uh, postdocs, uh, we, you know, we are an incredible amount of power. There are, um, I between UCAFT uh, and um, and us, you know, we represent, we do the majority of instruction at the university, and um, 
you know, and we again, we have an important role to play in transforming public education. Uh, and this is, I think, you know, again, this is what motivates me uh, to again see the UC to be a truly public um, institution. And this is why, uh, with 2065, we supported a number of uh, ballot initiatives, in, in addition to organizing on the shop floor, but also organizing on the political front because, uh, you know, politics is what determines the terrain of engagement with the university. And if we want to take on the university, we also have to be ready to take on the billionaire bosses that shape what the university looks like. Um, so, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Christine. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Mia and Lindsay and Litfest uh, for having me today. I represent um, about 2,700 staff members at Rutgers University. Um, the difficulty with being staff, uh, a staff representative, the president of a staff union is that when we talk about higher ed or pre-K to 12 education, frequently we focus on educators um, as teachers, faculty, um, lecturers, whatever. But the organization, any organization cannot function with those who are frequently overlooked and undervalued, right? There's an expectation that staff will continue to do the work, make, um, make everything behind the wheels, behind the scenes work seamlessly. And the union provides an opportunity for our voices to be heard. So there are um, frequently opportunities for us to step forward and step into spaces that we're not invited to. Um, so with collaboration with our, our, our community partners, other unions uh, at Rutgers University, right, including faculty, including lecturers, including blue collar workers, um, custodians, janitorial staff that are, again, frequently overlooked, it, it provides a holistic approach to what makes higher ed across the country work, right? It's not individual to Rutgers University. I think that this is, as we've seen, using uh, pandemic related excuses to to uh, threaten job security for the most vulnerable workers um, this past year, this this uh, this pandemic has given us an opportunity to kind of gather together and express that we're all workers, right? And we're all working towards the same goal. Um, and nobody should be left behind. And really, the only way to to collaboratively work together and to have all our goals expressed and taken seriously together is through our our individual unions, right? And we find commonalities um, that we weren't even aware of, and that I think is really important in this day and age. Trying to cross boundaries and create strategies that impact not only us, but our greater community, right? Rutgers University happens to be housed in three of the most um, limited resource communities across the state of New Jersey. And it's important for us to build those bridges, not only with our students, but with the citizenry across the state, right? And it, it gives um, using union power as a foundational uh, movement gives legitimacy to um, voices that may not normally be included. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Christine. I know common good demands um, a collective bargaining beyond uh, the bread and butter issues of wages and benefits are really key to what a lot of us think of as the new unionism. And I think Arlene is going to talk, uh, talk with us about that uh, in the UTLA context. Thank you so much, Mia. And it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, I am Arlene Noe, and I'm actually Three gener I was born and raised in Los Angeles with three generations of family who attended Los Angeles Unified School District. And um, I was a speech therapist for around 18 years and then enc encouraged to jump into be being an officer. So here I am. And I wanted to say that in going to LA Unified, um, the, I've seen the demographic shift from a majority white populations in the 50s and 60s to a majority students of color 
and to the present student population of 95% Black, Brown, Asian Pacific Islander and Indigenous students. And our sprawling school district is the second largest in the nation and covers over 700 square feet from San Pedro to the harbor. I mean, I'm sorry, San Pedro to the valley from East Los Angeles to the west. And as our schools have become more youth of color, uh, we've also seen an 85% are low income. And we have seen decades of austerity so that LA became, went to the bottom of the nation, 44th out of 50 in per pupil spending. We had the largest, the, the largest class sizes in the nation. School nurses were at only the, a school one day a week. And we did not have enough counselors, librarians and support services. So this has been the context for public education. And LA was, even though we're the fifth largest economy in the world, yet funding for public schools had dropped to 44th out of 50. So let's fast forward now to January, 2019, when the educators of LA went on strike. It was only the second strike in our 50 year history and members were scared. Many had never been on strike before, even though the first one was in 1989. And they said they couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford unpaid days for unspecified amount of time. They had FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And we had to just keep redirecting that to our purpose in striking. We were fighting for our students. We were fighting for resources and we were fighting for respect. Public education, uh, public educators, we've been attacked as bad teachers in bad low performing schools as cuts to staffing and programs have di been diverted to corporate charter schools that had no accountability, but with a marketing strategy of school choice and charters are better. So for six days in January, 2019, the city of LA erupted as 60,000 educators, teachers, along with parents, students, community members and organizations, clergy, labor partners, filled the city hall as our bargaining team was working on a contract day and night. Teachers picketed their school in the morning and then attended rallies in the afternoon. It was a sea of red, our UTLA colors. And with an unusually rain, rainy period, we saw red raincoats, red umbrellas, red boots, and jubilant faces that educators were seen and supported. There was hope that the narrative had changed around public education. And UTLA members told me that for the very first time, they were thanked for being a teacher. Tears filled their eyes as they said parents and community members without children dropped off donuts and coffee at their schools. Well, we won the strike, all that we needed and asked for, and even more. A school nurse, reduced class sizes, community schools, which is all alternative, our alternative to charters, less testing and more teaching, fair wages, and what you were bringing up, Mia, what we call common good or community demands, such as green space on campus, an immigrant fund, an end to the criminalizing of black and brown students through using these wands. Our UTLA strike was part of a strike wave of educators that has been sweeping the nation. We are a workforce of 75% and more female, who are fighting for our students. And basically we just had enough. We transformed UTLA in 2014 around an agenda for social, economic, educational and racial justice. And we built the union infrastructure to do it. Our strategy included deep organizing. It included a strong research and communications team a strategic plan that engaged members and developed new leaders and escalating actions. But it was much more than winning a strike and much more than what we had asked for. 
labor solidarity had taken root and workers were changed. They had experienced taking a risk, a collective risk with others and feeling the empowerment of being seen, heard and making change. Thanks, Arlene. Let's go to Todd and then Lindsay next. Hey, everyone. Um, wow, I have to follow Arlene. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's great to be at Lip Fest. It's also great to be at a panel of so many people who I look up to um, in the labor movement and some who I get to collaborate very closely with, like Christine. Um, I want to take a, a few minutes to talk about public higher ed, building on some of what Raphael said. Um, and, and also talk about the struggle that Christine and I have been involved in at Rutgers over the last year. Um, and, and just to build on what Raphael, is, Raphael said, I think it's important to mark that public higher ed, like K-12, is in has gone through this long process of disinvestment, right, from the federal and state government over the last four decades. Massive disinvestment where people, the, the resources have just been sucked out of our universities. Um, and the response from the major institutions or major public universities like the UC system and Rutgers has been, let's hand over our universities to corporate drones, largely lawyers, accountants, and bureaucrats. And so then these bureaucrats have taken control of our universities and they've responded to this larger fiscal crisis that the universities are in by running higher ed like it's a business. And I think we all know this, but it's important to market. And so what does that mean? It means prioritizing the growth of endowments or reserves over the core mission of the university. So more important to have a big, a big endowment than it is to do the, the job of teaching research and service, which is what we're meant to be doing. And then the outcome is, is things we all know, um, adjunctification, right? Less, uh, more precarious contingent labor that it doesn't, and, and workers who don't have full dignity at work, rising tuition costs, um, managerial bloat. So at Rutgers alone, we had in 2012, about 150 people making over $300,000 a year, all these um, bureaucrats I was mentioning. In 2020, there's over 300 of them making over $300,000 a year. Um, dismantling faculty governance, and faculty governance, as Christine and I will both tell you, is problematic from the jump, but still, They've dismantled it. And then at places like Rutgers, the other sort of things that they've been doing is this magical thinking that if they pump hundreds of millions of dollars into athletics, it will change the future of the university, which is crazy. It doesn't work. Um, so that's the broader context within where our public higher ed exists. And then flash forward and, and we, we go to a pandemic, right? And the pandemic hit higher ed particularly hard. 13% of the sector lost work. Um, in the last year, 650,000 jobs across the US in higher ed were lost. At Rutgers, going into the pandemic, we knew, Christine and I talked about this many times, we knew what university leadership would do when the crisis hit. And, and I would remind you that the first spike of the pandemic hit New Jersey particularly hard. We knew what they would do because we knew who they were and what they always did historically when crises hit. So they were going to have a twofold agenda. One, ride out the pandemic on the backs of the most vulnerable. In this case, low wage workers that are disproportionately women and people of color. We knew they were gonna do that. They were gonna punish the most vulnerable. And two, in, you know, Naomi Klein as a colleague at Rutgers and, and in her, based on her work, we knew they were gonna try to kind of enlist the shock doctrine, take advantage of the crisis to discipline the workforce in all sorts of ways. Take out all those old, old ideas to speed us up and, and bring them to, in, to bear. And that's exactly what they did do. And so we recognized this from the jump. So our counter move was to really build out what we call the Coalition of Rutgers Unions crew. And Christine and I both played a pretty central part in this. Um, to, and, and the goal was to build a united front of workers, students, and community. Rutgers is uh, the State University of New Jersey, and it's a complex institution. 70,000 students, 50,000 undergrad and 20,000 grad, and 30,000 workers, 20,000 unionized, and 10,000 non-union. Um, so 100,000 all told, but basically the university touches everybody in the state. Um, and so when we pulled together the coalition, what we were talking about was 19 unions. 
full-time faculty, adjunct faculty, grad workers, postdocs, but as Christine already marked, dining hall workers, dorm workers, groundskeepers, firefighters, administrative staff, and we also have a massive healthcare system. So we're talking about doctors, nurses, techs, et cetera, 20,000 workers. And we came to the administration maybe a month or two after the pandemic had hit and Rutgers had sent the students home, and we made a simple demand. We said, this is a public health crisis. Rutgers is a public university. Therefore, Rutgers should be a beacon in the dark and light the way. And our particular demand here was Rutgers has to take a people-centered approach to the pandemic. That means centering the most vulnerable. That means you don't lay people off in the midst of a pandemic and strip them of health care. The core of our campaign was solidarity. For instance, faculty agreeing to furloughs, and I, we won't have time to go into that, but agreeing to furloughs in order to save the jobs of staff, right? That was a centerpiece. And so our demands were no layoffs, look after our grad workers and give them an extension and look after our adjunct faculty. And we, we did something, actually, we took it from the LA Times, uh, Carolina, we, um, we took the work share program that you all enlisted and we offered it to the university. And basically what we said is here, if you, we do this work share program, everyone gets made whole because of the CARES Act. We saved the university $150 million, $150 million, and, and you don't lay anyone off. And they turned us down. And so and the reason I, I'm telling this story both because it's what we've been going through over the last year, but also because um, I think it's instructive well, well, I'll say this. First, I'll say we ultimately did win, but it took us nine more months. We offered this last summer. They turned it down. They laid off a thousand workers, largely low wage workers, disproportionately women and people of color. 400 adjuncts lost their work, etc. cetera. Um, but we kept fighting with job actions and political pressure. And we ultimately forced them to agree to this. Um, but I, I, I tell this anecdote and I'm going to shut down and, and, and kick it to the next person briefly, but because we stepped back and we were like, why did they turn down $150 million, which was actually the budget gap at the moment? And what we realized, and we actually heard this directly from the administration, is that they were deathly scared of a coalition of 20,000 workers leading the way during the pandemic. They were deathly afraid of it. And this anecdote matters because it helps, it helps me remember that moving forward, the story of new unionism is that we have to, we have to be bold. Labor must be big and bold. The last couple of decades have been increasingly defensive struggles, smaller and smaller fights around smaller and smaller boundaries. But the only way forward is to have bigger struggles, to do industrial organizing across our workplace and then in and with our communities as Arlene talked about. So I'll leave it there. Great to hear, Lindsay. Thanks, Mia, um, and thanks to all of you. Uh, really great to hear all of your stories. Um, you know, I think I had been thinking about the question that Mia sent us in an email in a slightly different way. So I'm trying to kind of reboot what I was planning on <laughs> saying as I've heard how everyone else approached it. So as I mentioned, I was a um, one of the lead organizers on the last big push uh, for a union of grad workers at Yale University. That is a 30, I, that fight started in the 90s was like the first real, so that's a really long fight <laughs> that we haven't won yet. We won our NLRB elections in 2017. Um, we did a, you know, 30 days of action, um, 30 days of action coming off of our elections to get the university to uh, settle a contract with us. We did an occupation in the middle of campus. We had people there 24 hours a day. Um, we did a um, a fast. We had eight grad students fasting at one point or another for 30 days. And we did a number of civil disobediences around New Haven to bring attention to, you know, all of the variety of, you know, abuses that happened within campus. A report had come out that semester that 60% of grad workers um, had reported sexual harassment at some point in their time in grad school at Yale. We did a civil disobedience around that. Um, and it wasn't enough, you know, Trump had just won uh, that we ended up having to pull our petition because the NLRB kind of shifted uh, to be more conservative. Um, and we feared that if our petition stayed in and Yale appealed it, that we would hurt the ability of grad workers to unionize uh, moving forward, which actually was a really good strategy because now 
the Columbia decision has remained, private university grad workers still have the right to unionize. But I think, you know, I was thinking about what Arlene said about FUD, and that's definitely, you know, if you're organizing in a hostile context where nobody has won for a long time, there are a lot of stories that get passed down about the faculty who failed their grad students on their exams because they were organizing or, you know, all of the bad things that have happened over the years get passed down as part of departmental culture. And it can be really hard to convince people not even just to like step forward for the union, but to even talk about what the problems are, right? And so you go into a new department and a lot of what you hear is, uh, you know, everything's fine here. I feel really lucky to be here. I'm not even sure I'm a worker. Um, you know, I get paid to read or whatever. Um, and then I think, you know, so I fear is one thing. And I think the other thing is the feeling that it's not possible. And I think that that's something that probably, um, that certainly was the case at Yale. And I think that's probably something folks grapple with across organizing campaigns across the country, you know, given the state that the labor movement has been in for so long, that it feels like there's so much that's up against us. And if people feel scared and if they don't feel like it's possible, they'll never even talk about what the problems are. Like it's hard to even get that far with them. And so a lot of what our work came down to is really building the relationships um, with people that allowed them to start talking about what the problems were, to feel like they weren't isolated, alone, um, wasn't their fault. Uh, and then kind of through that, building out that web of relationships that really makes it start to feel possible. Um, and that happens through private one-on-ones, that happens through committee meetings, and then through campaigns. And I would say my favorite campaign we ever ran was in um, maybe 2013, 2014, we did a photo campaign and our grad workers union at Yale is with Unite Here and Unite Here also um, has two recognized unions on campus and we have a community organizing kind of arm of the union. So we work in really deep coalition, um, similar to Rutgers, we work in really deep coalition with the other unions on campus um, as well as with folks in the community. And so we ran a photo campaign uh, where people, we had a uh, one grad worker paired with someone from another union or someone from the community and both kind of holding a sign with like saying, you know, I support the union or I'm going to vote yes on the union. Um, and we got 60% of grad students to each stand with someone else across the university, both to kind of build those individual relationships that this isn't just us. It's, uh, this is a big problem across the university. None of us have enough power on our own, right? We all have to come together if we're gonna fight this huge corporate university and then to kind of visualize that and show it. We did a big march across campus. We printed out all of the photos into like a huge scroll that we all carried to um, the president's office. So, you know, I mean, we haven't won yet. Um, so <laughs> I think it's an ongoing fight. Uh, it's, it's really challenging to organize in the private sector. Um, it's really challenging to fight the corporate university. But I really do feel like, you know, those coalitions rooted in really deep relationships and solidarity uh, it is the only hope for us to, to get there. Um, so that's my touchstone. Thanks, Lindsay. It's really clear to me listening to all of you that uh, we're, we learn so much from each other. We take inspiration from each other. We take courage from each other and that storytelling and, uh, and sharing of narratives is really essential to, um, to building our power and to, and to building our movement. And uh, to build a movement, we have to, we have to build a narrative. Um, so the second question that I asked you to consider was to recommend a contemporary creative work. It could be a book, could be a, a, a piece of journalism, could be a podcast, could be stand-up comedy, um, that, that to you um, says something important about working people or the, um, or the labor movement um, today. Uh, Lindsay, can we stick with you? Um, uh, can I ask you to go first for this question? I don't know that I have, I don't know, I hadn't come up with an answer for this question. <laughs> if I can do a shameless plug, I would like to recommend that folks check out The Forge, which is the journal that I edit. Arlene has written for it, so have Todd and Christine. Um, we're trying to kind of build, to build those relationships across the movement and create a space for folks to really share narrative practices and strategies. So I'm gonna do a plug for my own journal and I'll keep thinking, you can come back to me. <laughs> that is in fact why I wanted to go to you first so you could okay, talk okay, about great. the forge. Yeah. <laughs> great, okay, others? 
What, what do you recommend um, uh, that other people um, uh, read or, or listen to or, or watch to, to understand the new, union, the new unionism? So um, one of the coalition things that we did, one of the actions that we did was we built a book club, for lack of a better word, right? And we also participated in Jack, Jane McAlevey's uh, Organizing for Power. So I'm going to recommend No Shortcuts, um, Organizing for Power and the New Gilded Age. I think that that's a roadmap. It's also a history lesson. It's, it's really informative on how to create and craft relationships, um, you know, and, and taking a page from, from someone who is an inspiration and is uh, so powerful in her own right. Um, and has so much knowledge, I think we can only, if we can duplicate half of or a quarter of the things that she has done um, using the blueprint that she has worked all her life to lay out, uh, will be incredible. Christine totally stole my answer. And this is why we're all like. I was going to, I even grabbed it. Um, I think everyone knows Jane, or at least on the panel. I don't mean, I'm sure people out there don't, but I, I really do recommend it too. We sent, I mean, I think about 80 people to strike school um, in the fall. Um, it, And then we started a reading group across all the unions um, where we read it closely. And, and there are just important lessons about who are the real leaders that you want to build a union around. Um, which push against common sense. The common sense is you want to find the loudest person who comes to all the actions, the, you know, who, and, and that's actually not where you want to root your unions, but you want to root your unions in the people that everyone trusts, the people that people turn to when they have a problem, what she calls organic leaders. And, and so that and charting and super majority strikes, which means if you're going to go out on strike, like um, UTLA did so beautifully, which we all love and Certainly in Rutgers, we all look to the uh, LA Teachers Union as one of the great models for what we want to do, um, um, that you want to do it with a large majority of your members to, to actually win. And so I feel bad. I also wanted to have some like sexy sci-fi thing and say, look at how this sci-fi thing mirrors what we're in. But I didn't have one. So I was like, okay, fine, Jane, it'll be boring. But then Christine took it. I'm done. Thank you. I'll, I'll pop in with the weird stuff since I'm the culture <laughs> journalist. Um, I, because I am a culture journalist, I came up with um, works largely rooted in fiction because I think the issue of work and organizing has been materializing in our culture here and there. Um, I'd say first on my list is uh, Boots Riley's, um, I think the film is from 2018, Sorry to Bother You in which there is a, 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 in this somewhat absurd and surreal film, there is a union unionization campaign in the midst. It also deals a lot about, you know, with questions of race in the workplace. Um, it, it is not a straightforward Norma Ray type of picture, so don't expect that, but I just think it's definitely a new approach to the subject. Um, the other thing that I think is fantastic is uh, Lynn Natasha's 2017 play Sweat. Um, she won the Pulitzer uh, for it. And uh, since this is a literary festival, I figured I'd get kind of literary. Um, and it examines, again, this kind of question of race and work and solidarity in a Pennsylvania uh, mill town um, with a cross-cultural uh, cast of characters. I had the good fortune of seeing it here at the Center Theater at the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles. I know it has played in New York as well, and certainly the play uh, is available in written form. Um, and then, you know, I wanted, the last work was a work that was just very inspiring. It's an old work and, a, and kind of an old school piece of oral history and journalism, but it was very inspiring to me when I wanted to become a writer in high school, and that is Studs Terkel's Oral History Working, um, in which, you know, he just gets this wide range of, if you have not read it, this wide range of people talking about their work and what it means to them and what it doesn't mean to them and the challenges they face and the limitations they see and um, the things that potentially hold them 
back in it. And to some degree, I feel like that book, um, it's, it's kind of this great organizing document because it really synthesizes quite beautifully a lot of the issues that people face at work, some of them spiritual and emotional, but some of them also having to do very much with questions of how they are remunerated and what futures um, they see in, in their work. So I definitely an oldie, but a goodie, but highly, highly recommend. I'd like to jump in and I don't know if you could see this. Oops, wrong side. See this, teacher unions and social justice by rethinking schools. I see Todd raving his hand up there. Um, it's our, I like the cover is um, our UTLA strike. And again, the red, which is our union color. And that's a early educator who's on the, who I'd never seen before. So beautiful picture. Uh, but this is a real, it's about a 400 page compilation uh, with charts and stories and history uh, and perspectives for the past 30 years. I mean, there was a first edition that was written, uh, I don't remember if it was in the 80s or 90s, but this is uh, the current edition, which is about three times larger in, in volume. But what I love about it is it's so easy to read. Um, it's really about all of those stories. And, you know, you look across the country. I mean, there's stories from Chicago, of course, New Jersey, Baltimore, small rural areas, large urban districts. Uh, there's stories about women leaders who formed the union. Uh, there's just so much to glean from, you know, anybody could find something to learn th throughout the book. But I think what it really pointed out for me too, just in, in reviewing it, is that, you know, we all are kind of doing the same things or we know what to do. I mean, we have the knowledge. As, as Lindsay was saying, relationships, one-on-one -on -one conversations, finding out what people, what is stopping people, what, what they're bringing, and working it through and redirecting that and bringing up again, what is the choice? Do you want things to continue the way it is? Or do you want to be part of a movement that forces change? Uh, and I think what I loved about seeing in our strike was that people really got out of the individualism that is so part of our culture to really see and experience the collective power of ordinary people, of workers, of teachers, coming together with our parents, with our community, with our students, with our clergy, you know, with our community organizations, and together uniting around basic issues of social justice that everybody needs in our community. Uh, and so the power of the organizing stories and seeing the common patterns Everybody follows the same kind of steps, but you do it slightly different, or you might emphasize or prioritize different things. But the power is of the new unionism is, I believe, really uh, shown in this book. So I recommend it. Um, yeah, I I actually wanted to second uh, no shortcuts. I mean, it's a book that uh, for many of us has also been extreme, very ex inspiring, and uh, taught us a lot about how to organize um, in at, at the at the UC. Um, and I think speaking to something that Lindsay brought up earlier about all the how difficult it is sometimes to organize in academia. Uh, I think a lot of times so people feel like it's almost impossible, uh, and a lot of pointing to things like um, how churn how you know we are only here for a couple of years and then we move on and how do you or possibly organize in such a situation i mean i think that there's a, a chapter in those shortcuts on the uh, unionization drive at smithfield uh that really uh you know it's like they, they had like a hundred almost a hundred percent turnover yearly turnover and yet they were still able to put, you know put on a super majority strike threat and succeed in w getting winning a union um and then the other text that I think I would also uh, recommend is uh, Vivian Gorick's uh, The um, the Romans of American Communism. Um, and it's just such an, 
it's uh, it, it was published originally in the 1970s and was recently republished. Uh, but it's just uh, what I love about it is just um, it, she port, uh, portrays uh, the lives of the left uh, in the 1940s and 50s, and it's just like there was a sense of real solidarity among workers that uh, really uh, you know wish we could somehow that we will recapture one day. Um, but yeah, also two books that I, I would recommend. Wonderful, great recommendations everywhere. We're going to wrap up now. I do want to say that I think one, one way we know we're in a very exciting moment for the, for the labor movement and we're in the middle of new unionism is that there's a lot of very exciting labor journalism and really too many um, uh, great labor journalists to name, but I'll, I'll just say a few names, um, Sarah Jaffe, Kim Kelly, Maximilian Alvarez, um, all doing really great work um, covering and, and, and reporting on and translating the labor movement for, uh, for new generations. The Working People podcast also is really building on that Studs Terkel legacy um, and uh, uh, really um, prioritizing the narratives of um, the working lives of working people. So I think that's a great one also. Um, and as we wrap up here, I uh, uh, want to thank everybody for um, bearing with my technical difficulties at the beginning of our session. I want to thank Kat Ward with LitFest um, for making this all possible logistically. I really especially want to thank Toby Harper, um, our tech support at LitFest, for getting us through those, those technical difficulties. And I want to ask everybody to keep your eyes and ears open for our UCAFT uh, teaching faculty bargaining campaign. We've been bargaining for two years with UC management, primarily over job stability for contingent teaching faculty. We want to make sure that great teachers at the UC can keep their jobs um, uh, and, don't, and don't get churned out. Um, so you may be hearing more about our campaign in the future. Please keep an eye out for it. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to all of our viewers and listeners also.